something intriguing happens when we are faced with puzzles, doesn't it? Readers, we love parsing clues and guessing the motives of our favorite protagonists and of our favorite villains. Nothing really gets us into a story more than trying to figure out how all those puzzle pieces go together. And that's why we have Samuel Burr with us today. He is an author, a freelance TV executive, and a cat lover who is old at heart. His book, The Fellowship of Puzzle Makers, is part mystery and part coming of age novel that enfolds through puzzle infused prose. Sam, welcome to the book fest. Thank you so much. It's lovely to be here. I am. Well, I'm excited to have you from across the pond. Um, thank you for joining us at this hour. So let's get into it. Can you talk a little bit about why, why are humans, why are we such puzzle fans? Why do we like to solve puzzles? It's a really good question. And the thing that I've sort of learned and, and sort of been really fascinated by during this process of writing the book is that actually even if you don't class yourself a puzzle as, as, a, as a puzzler we all have sort of memories of puzzling um it's sort of part of our dna and whether that's sort of playing with a shape sorter as a child or doing jigsaws with your grandparents or you know wordle on the on the um on the tube um i think we're all sort of fascinated in uh challenges that uh that challenge us and also things that make us feel that we're cleverer than perhaps we already thought we were um anything that sort of makes us feel better about ourselves and also i think what's what's particularly relevant these days is how puzzles are a perfect distraction from the sort of uh very busy digital lives that we lead um the thing about puzzles is that when you're really focusing on a puzzle you are only focusing on that one thing and you're not you're not worrying or stressing about uh, everyday worries that you might have if you were um, scrolling through Instagram or looking, you know, through your emails. There's something about puzzles that do make you switch off. And um, I think that's probably something we could all do with in the, these days. That's a really good point. I think that's why when you talk about mysteries, you have so, so much, many readers in the cozy side of mysteries, for example, because it is, it's that comforting, warm feeling and you can just escape for a while. And you touch on something that I think is really fascinating too, because you talk about, you know, when we're kids, we're figuring out puzzles, literally jigsaw puzzles, which reminds yeah. me of your book. And there's also word puzzles. You mentioned Wordle, and there's all sorts of different, there's crossword puzzles, which I am not a fan of, never like those crossword puzzles, but I like <laughs> finding my way through mazes. You know, I like those yes. kind of puzzles. Do you think that the different types of puzzle people that we are might relate to the different types of genres and types of books we like to read? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, also, I think it, you know, depending on the way that your your brain is made up, I'm I'm someone that's quite good. I like word based puzzles. I know lots of other people that are all about sort of. Um, uh, like you say mazes and sort of shapes and so i think i think it is really fascinating to see which ones we connect with and which ones we are um we're able to solve in terms of like how it uh how it relates to our reading habits i guess one of the things that i've been really interested in is looking back at the sort of heritage of um puzzles within literature and actually c.s lewis was a great fan of including puzzles in his work he would use a cro he would place secretly place acrostics um, within the sort of uh, the way that he'd sort of typeset his text. So it does go back quite a way, but I'm seeing a real sort of resurgence of it actually now. There's sort of a, particularly in the UK, I'm sure it's the, the same in the, in the US and around the world, but there's a sort of new genre of mystery, which is puzzle fiction, which is similar to what I've been doing, which is uh, including, you know, writing a story, creating a narrative, but using puzzles to sort of make the story somehow interactive. Um, and that's what I've done with my book. I've tried to um, create a story where you read and play along. And actually, if you're a puzzle mate, if you're a puzzler, that's fantastic. You can sort of puzzle and, and read as you go. But if you're not, you can also just enjoy it for the story. I've really sort of tried to make sure that um, it doesn't put people off if you're, if you're not a puzzler. Um, but at the same time, it's a, it's a lovely bonus if you are. And you've got a, a couple of things going on in your book, too. It's also a part coming of age story. How does that all work together? Well, um, 
the, the, the novel that I've written is called The Fellowship of Puzzle Makers. Um, it's the story of Clayton Stumper. Clayton is a young man who's sort of grown old before he's grown up, is how I describe him. He dresses like your granddad and he drinks sherry like your aunt. Um, and at 25, he finds himself as one of the last surviving members of this very British institution, which is the Fellowship. Um, here is where he was abandoned at birth. So um, what's sort of unique about this place is, is that it's made up by, of some of the most clever, brilliant minds in the country. Um, so among them, we've got a maze maker, a quiz setter, um, a jigsaw artist, a crossword compiler, uh, to name just a few. But there's a mystery at the heart of the fellowship, and that's a sort of puzzle that's yet to be solved, and that's how Clayton came to live there and where he's come from. So in the novel, we follow the founder of the fellowship. Um, uh, she bequeaths her puzzle, a final puzzle, to Clayton, and then we follow Clayton on a quest as he begins to sort of piece together the clues um, of his past. I love it. I love it. There's so much good stuff going on in your book. Um, and you are a TV executive too, right? D does Absolutely, that yeah. Trans yeah. Does that translate think, at all? Do you, as a writer, as a creative, does that go together? I think what, what um, so my, my job in television was, is sort of pitching, devising and pitching new TV concepts. Um, I always used to work in unscripted, actually. So I've never sort of worked in the fictional world in television. I always worked in documentaries or reality TV. Um, but what I got used to is being able to sort of sell an idea, a concept really, really quickly because my TV colleagues had just the attention span of a gnat and I just had to instantly hook them with the idea. So I think that's really helped me as I've moved into books is to sort of um, be able to pitch my ideas really, really quickly. It's such a competitive market. And so you really want the thing that sort of makes you stand out and also excites the reader, makes, makes someone want to pick up your book. Um, it's funny, when I first shared the early chapters in my, read, in my read, uh, writing group, the first reaction was, oh, this would make a great TV series. And I think it's the way that I sort of think about um, ideas. I've always, when I, when I translate an idea, I'm always thinking about how, um, what I'm going to be, what we're looking at, where we're pointing the camera. And so as I'm, as I'm writing, I'm doing exactly the same. I'm sort of imagining the world and I'm almost walking the reader through that world. Um, so it's highly visual and yeah, I've, I've spent a lot of time sort of building the world of Creighton Hall, which is where the fellowship headquarters is. Um, and I've had great fun doing that too. And when you're writing something like this, do can you talk a little bit about your methodology? I mean, are you figuring out your puzzles in your story and working backward? How are you pull, pulling That's that right. all together? It was an absolute nightmare, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> it was so difficult. Um, I mean, any book is, any writing any novel is hard. And actually writing any novel, regardless of genre, is a bit of a jigsaw. You've got to sort of find the right pieces, find out where everything belongs. It's a lot of moving stuff around. Um, and it was no exception with this story. I think what I knew I wanted to do was to have a, a puzzle or a series of puzzles sort of uh, interlaced throughout the story that sort of moved the story on and pushed the characters in different directions. Um, so I had sort of placeholders of what those puzzles were going to be, um, but I'm not a professional puzzle maker. And so it's been a real education in learning how to you know, create the perfect crossword grid. Um, knowing that that has should be 13 by 13 squares. Um, and so, yeah, it has been, it's been tough. But yeah, ultimately what I wanted to do with the puzzles was to, for the solutions to um, uh, push the character Clayton towards different themes, different ideas that would, um, uh, yeah, encourage him to meet new people, to, to be in new situations. And that's where the sort of coming of age element comes in. The idea is that this puzzle has been bequeathed to him because they know that he's lived quite a restricted life with these puzzle makers in this house. They want him to go out and experience the world. And what I loved is that um, the cast of older puzzle makers um, have lived their lives. They've, they've, they've met, you know, they've, they've seen things, they've learned their lessons, their life lessons, and now they're willing to pass that on to someone much, much younger. So um, yeah, that was the idea of the puzzles, but it's, it, we've got a maze, we've got a crossword, um, we've got cryptograms, we've got word searches. It was great fun, I have to say, but typesetting the book has been a real challenge, making sure that we don't make any mistakes. Fingers crossed, I think we're all pretty much there, but yeah. 
I, I can only imagine you you mentioned C.S. Lewis and you 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 make me conjure up, you know, Agatha Christie and Arthur Conan Doyle and some of the greats, because it's hard enough to write a good mystery. And when you've got the theme woven in there too, along with the puzzles, pulling that all together, that takes brilliance. Did you call up some puzzle makers to help you out? Or did you do this all on your own? How did how did that work? I've done it mostly on my own. I've done a lot of research um, and I had a fantastic team around me. Um, the team at Doubleday uh, in America have been fantastic and very supportive. Um, we've got fantastic sort of design teams that have helped me sort of design various elements. Um, I think what's really nice is that because the world that I've created is a sort of unique world of puzzle makers where they're, they're creating their own brands of, of puzzles, I've been quite sort of free to sort of experiment with different types of puzzles. And so all the puzzles have a slight twist um, to make them unique. So actually, I'm trying to do something that um, feels unique and feels specific to the world that I'm creating, which is the fellowship. Um, so, yeah, it has been good fun. I have to be honest, I got, did get halfway through and I did think to myself, what am I doing? What have I done? This is the hardest thing I've ever done. But um, I'm glad. I think sometimes, as, as one of my characters says um, in the book, nothing worth solving is ever easy. And I think, yeah, this book in particular was something that, um, took a lot of work, but I'm really, really proud of it, actually. The, the final result is something I'm really, really pleased with. You should be. It really is an outstanding book. And I'm curious because you're talking about the character and the fellowship and describing that, that a little bit. And then also, you say that you are old at heart. What do you mean by that? Well, I've always sort of had, I've always identified um, with older people, and I've always had... I've actually had some fairly extraordinary older people in my life that have sort of shaped me into who I am. Um, to give you an example, um, several years ago now, I, I signed up to become a volunteer telephone friend uh, for an elderly charity in the UK. So that meant that every week I would make a call to an older person who um, was socially isolated. Sometimes these people might go days, even weeks without speaking to another person. Um, and so that gave me huge inspiration for the book. The Fellowship of Puzzle Makers is a book about puzzle making, but it's also about community. It's about a fellowship. It's about a group of people that come together and support each other. Um, it's about a sort of found family. It's about friendship. Um, and that very much was inspired by the people I spoke to. Um, I've learned an awful lot from the volunteering and from the older people that I speak to. Um, hopefully, you know, as much as they're benefiting from hopefully my conversations each week, I've benefited just benefited just as much too from speaking to them. So um, there's actually a character in the book who is very much um, inspired by, um, yeah, one of my telephone friends. And I actually was able to sort of use some of her dialogue um, within the book itself. I actually asked her to sort of talk about what it felt like to be alone and to be an older person who doesn't speak to anyone for several days. And that's become part of the book. I'm really, really proud to sort of give um, that lady a voice um, in an unusual way within the story. That's really touching. That's really amazing that you did that, Sam. Congratulations on that. That just, you, you got me. You got me in the feels oh, there, buddy. Great, okay. thank you. One last question before we go. Okay. okay, you ready for it? Yes. Dogs or cats? Oh, this is very difficult because I've just spent all day with my parents' dog and she's, oh, she's absolutely adorable, oh. Tara. I'm going to have to, I'm going to whisper cats um, only because there's a, there's several cats in the fellowship and there's something slightly mysterious. I, I'm puzzling about cats. You, you don't really understand them. You don't really know what they're thinking, whereas dogs would give a little bit more out. So I'm going to say cats, but I'm not going to say it too loudly because there's a dog next door. I understand. I understand. You don't want to tick off those dogs. And honestly, That's I'd right. rather not tick off the cats because I think what they're thinking is that when you die, <laughs> I will eat you. <laughs> yes, exactly. Samuel Burr, thank you so much for being with us. I appreciate it. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me.